leadership development in construction. That is what this episode of Construction Genius is all about with my guest, Wes Palmisano. He is the founder, CEO, and floor sweeper at Impetus. Impetus has offices in New Orleans and Nashville, Tennessee, and it has quickly established itself as a top-level national player in construction services. So the good news is we're not talking to a theory person today. We're talking to someone who has practiced the art of developing leaders in construction as the leader of a construction company. We kick off by talking about the SAM model of setting direction, aligning resources, and then motivating and inspiring the troops. We take a deep dive into his 70-20-10 development model, which includes technical skills, mentoring, and leadership development. We talk about how he has developed a team of teams within his organization and how he balances incentives and reward structures so that a team of teams functions well and shares resources effectively. We talk about some of the challenges that most leaders face when they go from building projects to building people. We talk about how to motivate internal mentors to develop people and not be afraid of those folks stealing their spot. And we also talk about how to hire outside executive coaches. So it's a wide ranging conversation. And again, the thing I like about Wes is he's actually doing it right now, building a construction company from zero to over a hundred million in a very short period of time. In fact, he's up to 250 million. And so he's going through the process and spending a lot of time and energy on getting the people side of the equation right. So that's what this next hour is going to be all about. So make sure that you're taking notes mentally or on paper if you're not driving and enjoy my conversation with Wes. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration. And this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Wes, welcome to Construction Genius. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to have you on because... um, we're going to talk about leadership today, and you actually know what you talk about. You're talking about because you are the founder and CEO of your construction company. So um, I'm excited to get an expert here on the show to take a deep dive. So I'd, I'd like to ask my my first question here is, what is leadership? Leadership for us, in the way that we always have viewed it, and in the way that we like to define it with our teams, is in the especially in the construction industry. Let's just say is the ability to set direction for the team around you, to align the resources and, and all the things at your disposal as a leader to, uh, to get everyone on the same page and marching in the right direction. And then at the same time, being able to motivate and inspire your troops. And that's something that we lean pretty heavily on is we'd like to keep things simple and dial in and focus on something that is, is not unique to us, We actually have adopted this from others and it's a resource that we found, but we call it the SAM model. And it's something that, you know, again, I I guess from my perspective, we've seen it used numerous times around the industry and, and we're happy to, to repurpose things that resonate with us. And, and, uh, and that SAM model, which is set direction, align resources, motivate and inspire is how we like to teach people in our organization to be leaders and to, to excel at all three of those areas generally works well in the construction industry. That's beautiful. I really appreciate that. Let's take a, a dive into those then. What do you mean by the ability to set direction? So set direction is being able to communicate the big picture mm. team around you to have them understand what the task is at hand and, and what we're trying to accomplish. But from the perspective of being able to see the big picture, a lot of times in our industry, people tend to dive straight into the details and maybe don't understand the fundamentals of the big picture and the why behind what they're doing. And there's an opportunity when we talk about setting direction to have people understand this really deep why behind what we're doing that then starts to create an understanding of the bigger picture, which then allows you to get into the details of the day-to-day task and the things that ultimately aggregate to success down the road. Um, 
So one of the challenges I know many people have is that they have a clear understanding in their mind about what the big picture is, but then sometimes they have a diff difficulty articulating that clearly to others. Um, is there a particular method that you guys use or a framework that you have so that the leader is able to set out what that, that big picture is? Uh, I mean, of course, communication skills are, are fundamental to being able to connect the big picture to the smallest details, but we have a methodology as well. And this is something that we teach in our leadership academy that we call zoom in, zoom out, which is this concept uh, similar to what you're describing in that we understand the why behind what we're doing. We understand the big picture, but then we also understand that in our industry, it is about the details. And so we have to be able to zoom in to the smallest degree. And we have some exercises that we run in our leadership academy that teaches some of the fundamentals about how do we work together, how do we communicate, and how does a team ultimately translate that big picture vision down to the smallest details and, um, and be able to do both, which then backs into in our industry and project success, of course, also then ties into scheduling methodologies and you know how do we actually plan and progress the schedule and, and the work that we're doing of the philosophy and tying that same thought process to our scheduling process and philosophies. And, you know, there's certainly a lot more detail that goes into that. Um, but, you know, it, it, I, I think is looking at it cohesively as a program where there's this fundamental understanding, but then there's also the process and the methodologies that support that understanding. Can you give us an example of one of those exercises that you, you use to, to work through that zoom in zoom out process? Yeah, there's a team exercise that we always have a great time with at our leadership academy. And that team exercise is, I, I want to say the number is 64 different images mm. that are shuffled up and then handed out to a group. Usually we have groups of 12. So each individual uh, is getting five, couple have six, but they're getting five or so pictures. And that group then has to, without showing anyone, so there's 12 people that are just thrown into this chaos and they don't really know how the pictures connect to each other. And that exercise then forces them because you can't show your images to anyone else in the group. So then 12 people have this chaos so they have five different images and they have to start talking through in a timed exercise. How do we communicate with each other? What we're seeing. Mm. And ultimately the goal is to put those images in order. Mm concept is one of them is starting in out in space as a view of earth and the other is it the last image is dialed in on a tiny little speck on the surface of the earth and so as they talk through it and they don't know what's on each other's images and what they're looking at and so it create it starts out as chaos and what you see and witness in that exercise is that certain individuals will emerge pretty quickly as leaders in the group and start organizing people and then they start communicating and talking through it. And in fact, the last time we did it a few weeks ago in that exact format that I'm describing, the team actually got it perfect and worked through it over the course of about 15 minutes and orchestrated this exercise where they actually put them face down on the floor. And then you flip over all the cards and see if they're actually in sequential order as they're supposed to be. And it's pretty interesting to watch and observe from the outside you know, of how that actually takes place. And, and, um, and then everyone enjoys it because they take away from it. You know, how, what, what did we learn? How did we transform what started out as chaos into something orderly? How do we communicate with each other to accomplish that? And, you know, what started out as, as this, you know, fun game, they actually learn a lot of leadership lessons out of. That's tremendous. Um, do you know what that exercise is called? I don't, no idea. We, we call it zoom in, zoom out. <laughs> I really like that because you, you, you begin to identify then people who are um, conceptual thinkers and then people who are linear thinkers. And, you know, obviously on a, in, a, in a construction project, you need be, to be able to do both or at least have a team where you have the conceptual people and the linear thinkers at the same time. Yeah. And this is usually a varied group, you know, and it, it's people from our organization. Some may be more field oriented, some from the project management realm. Some may be from our corporate services group, um, office personnel. So, you know, kind of broad variety of people that are thrown in this exercise together that haven't really worked together in the past. And, 
you know, the lessons that come out of that are tremendous. What do you think is, um, j- skipping the line just for a moment to, to the motivate, what do you think the connection is between understanding that big picture and then motivating the crew when they're having to grind through, let's say, a difficult week? There's definitely a, a connection that can be made there. And there's a great opportunity when people understand the why behind what they're doing, whether we're talking about corporate purpose, obviously at the highest level of the why and people identifying with corporate purpose and really being driven by that corporate purpose because it's something that inspires them. That at the biggest level from an organizational perspective to the project itself. And what we try to do is establish a purpose and a a why at the project level, which then again, the team rallies behind the thought process of the work we're doing is important. And I understand why it's important, which then drives motivation of when things get tough, we know why we're we're doing this tough work and we understand the impact that this project may have on the broader community or uh, the people that are going to utilize the building, the people that are going to utilize the road or the infrastructure we might be building. And, you know, there's certainly an importance to the level of work that we do and the physical nature of it translates to some positive benefit in society. And so there's all kinds of ways to connect this deeper meaning and purpose that then when you actually get to the point when going gets tough, there's this thought process that what we're doing is bigger than ourselves and continues to motivate us to move forward. I mean, and and then the other aspect of motivation that we like to lean into is just the people side of the equation. Knowing and understanding your people and what drives them as individuals. You know, we know them and, and to the extent that you can know them at a really deep level, it provides also an opportunity for teams to really be uh, tied together and bound together in a unified group. And, you know, there are a lot, so many lessons on that side, motivate and inspire that we look at professional sports and, you know, high performance teams. There's so many lessons to be learned and parallels that can be drawn to how do we create a similar high performing culture and hold hold ourselves to similar standards to what you may see in professional sports. That's an analogy that we like to talk to our teams about and, um, and look at on a regular basis is that, you know, there are a lot of lessons to be learned that can translate to construction. What do you say to people when you're talking about the why and they're looking at you saying, you know, Wes, I know why I'm here. I'm here to make some money on this project and, and to make a profit. I mean, this is a business after all. I mean, how do you deal with people who have that kind of mindset? Well, I mean, I guess within our teams, what we found is that the ones that really buy in and identify with who we are as a business, which is Right. As an in, as an organization, you know, and certainly it's hard to it, the the control or the level of buy in that uh, you may be trying to get with trade partners is usually a little more difficult. Right. And and certainly that's where the instances that you describe would usually come in, because we generally find that our teams are are pretty bought in yeah. and uh, and are motivated. We have really high performance culture and, you know, a very strong culture at that. And so our teams tend to be dialed in from a cultural perspective where we do have struggles on particular projects is in many cases, you know, sometimes certain trade partners don't necessarily identify with our culture because they have different perspectives. So then it's definitely a challenge to motivate and and get people to buy in to that culture. And we've had we've still had a lot of success um, over time with getting people to understand that. Yes, we're there to make money, both individually and as an organization. Uh, and, and certainly we need to be profitable to continue doing what we're doing. But the money is a byproduct of the work that we do and ultimately generating success. And so if we can produce on the deeper meaning and the why, certainly the money takes care of itself. And, you know, that we, we um, you know, you, you certainly hit the nail on the head and that it's challenging and it's not easy to, uh, to have everybody buy into that philosophy, but we certainly try. And, you know, in the instances where we have uh, had challenges of getting cultural alignment and teamwork right on the jobs, there are certainly uh, instances where we've actually had to move on from certain individuals yes. and try to bring in a different team. And, you know, of course, that's the same, again, the same as the professional sports analogy. Sometimes as a member of the team in the locker room, that's that's upsetting the culture of what the coach is trying to create. 
and that player ultimately exits the organization and they bring in someone different who may be more on board with what they're trying to accomplish. And so that becomes necessary at times as well when we have someone who's completely misaligned with with the culture of the the team and the job site. Let's talk about that for a moment because one of the biggest challenges that many of the clients I work with have is is that they say, you know, Eric, I know that this guy right here is a C player um, and he's not a fit for my organization, but <laughs> we have all of these projects on the books that we've got to get built and I need at least a warm body. So in your experience, Wes, I know that's it. So that's why when I'm talking to my clients, I'm not like saying, you got to fire him today. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, listen, you've got the schedule of games on the, on, on your calendar. You've got to play the games, but you're saying noted. I note that this guy's not a, an A player and I'm always looking to replace those C players if I can. Describe to us, Wes, how you handle that type of situation based on your experience. Our philosophy on that is, you know, to your point, certainly everyone's always trying to have as many A players on the field as possible. Um, and, you know, there are certainly instances where people are not performing to the level of the standard that um, that we would like. So that generally is accompanied with a real effort to help that individual grow and succeed. And the number one driver of that is, you know, is that individual culturally aligned and, you know, philosophically aligned with our organization? And in that case, we'll certainly put a big investment into helping them improve and develop their skill set to ultimately get some reps in, get practice and move towards being an A player. In other instances, when, the, when there's a cultural misalignment, we would ordinarily move towards trying to have that individual exit and ultimately find a place where they're in a better situation to succeed because they're you know ultimately not aligned and it's not doing them justice um, or us to have that misalignment from a cultural and, and phil philosophical perspective. And then where we found the most success as well is having a robust recruiting program into the organization from entry level so that people are trained and developed in our organization and in our culture. And, you know, because we have a strong culture, we certainly are an organization that, you know, we've recognized for a long time now that developing people are within our own systems and through our own talent development process has paid extreme dividends for us. And so we continue to double down on that philosophy of internal developing people and, um, and having them bought into our systems from the beginning. Yeah. So it's interesting. So it's, it's almost as if you're, 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 it sounds like what you're doing is you're, you're committed to recruiting people at an entry level position who are a cultural fit and then taking those cultural fits and giving them the technical skills they need to be able to grow within the organization if they're able to do that. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and you know, we even have a, a philosophy around how those people are developed as well, which is a 70, 20, 10, which 70 percent of that development it, the expectation is that they're on the job supervisor is developing the technical skills and capabilities that they need. So for, I guess, and, and this is prefaced maybe if I take one step back by the fact that you just mentioned, which is this individual is culturally and philosophically aligned with our organization and is bought into our culture. Once they're bought in, 70% of that training and development happens on the job, working directly with supervisor. Everyone in our organization has a mentor as well that's helping them from a career development perspective, in addition to their direct supervisor. So the mentor is someone other than the direct supervisor. So we've got this intentional development and a lot of that is happening over the course of the day to day. The other 20% is this intentional, that, that's the piece of the mentor I mentioned, this intentional, I've always got goals that I'm striving for as an individual. There are opportunities for me to improve. Those are identified and coached upon on a consistent basis. The last 10% is our formal leadership development programs that are open to everyone in the organization. And we put a ton of time, energy, and effort into developing people and their own potential and helping them realize their own potential. Uh, and in most cases, people are, are capable of way more than, than, um, than they realize on the front end. How did you structure your company to be able to, because when, when you're describing this, it's tremendous, but the objection I'm hearing from people is, Wes, that's nice for you. I don't have the time to do that. 
How did you structure your company intentionally to be able to develop this process, both from the perspective of hiring people who are a cultural fit and then developing them, them through this 70-20-10 process? I've got similar reactions and we you know, have talked about this topic with others in the industry and certainly have heard uh, similar reactions. And especially when you start to look at our leadership development program that we've been working on now over the last five years, and it's been continuous improvement uh, every step of the way over the last five years. You know, so I would say that we're not that far into the journey yet, you know, being only five years into this leadership development academy, you know, and having a formal structured program, our develop leadership development offerings, if if I were to show pull up or, or show our catalog of offerings, it really gets people in the industry exhausted. And, you know, the perspective that you're describing of how do you possibly have time to do this when you actually build anything? Yeah, right. Uh, you're doing all these leadership development programs. And when do your people actually have time to work right. if you're expecting them to develop like this? And of course, what we've found over the years is that it it has been a huge factor, you know, and certainly one of the primary factors in our success where people are cohesive, working really well together, align culturally, understand the fundamentals of our process and procedures, uh, and just at a deep fundamental level, have a level of commitment to the organization and the job that, you know, we've certainly seen big gains and, you know, productivity in people's uh ability to deliver on, on their, each of their respective positions. And so we actually see it the opposite way, uh, is the honest truth. And that the investments that we make and the additional time that we put into developing people has paid off for us organizationally in a huge way. And the people that are doing a lot of the mentoring and coaching within the organization also see those benefits and, and are willing to make time for it. And so it's certainly been a shift. And a lot of people in our organization have, you know, of course, worked other places before. And I think times come in with a little bit of a skeptical perspective. But, you know, all we try to encourage people to do in terms of other organizations in the industry is just to get started and do something, you know, and, and do something intentional to develop and help your people grow and find opportunities to improve and to develop a growth mindset in your people you know, versus a more fixed mindset that I am who I am and, you know, this is what I'm going to be. Instead, let's focus on I can always continue to get better and I'm going to strive to be better as an individual. And, you know, the thing that we usually do is just to say, you know, is, is just get started on the journey and, you know, we'll be a better industry for it if we can all start to band together and do something to uh, to help our people continue to grow as leaders. From a soft skill perspective, what is the first, um, like say I want to get started, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, um, and I want to take the first you know, bite of the elephant or the apple or whatever we're eating here. Um, what, is the, what is the first aspect of soft skills that you would encourage a construction company to focus on in terms of that leadership development? The biggest gaps um, that we find and that you know, tend to be challenges for some people in the industry is the, and I guess I'll, I'll preface this by saying in today's industry, which I, I think has been a little bit of a shift for the industry over time is the notion. And certainly we're firm believers in this aspect of there's not as much hierarchy in the industry as what things used to be, yeah. you know, where you have these kind of strong dominant controlling personalities that, just tell everybody what to do. Mm -hmm. I think the expectation of how people show up today is way more collaborative. Yeah. And, and this aspect of teams is what delivers success and let's leverage everyone's potential. So that aspect of how do we work together and work really well as a cohesive team and the ideas and concepts around teamwork are one that we focus on a lot, uh, which then, you know, if you start to think about what makes a good teammate, how do we work together as a team? Uh, things like communication are, vitally important and, you know, how do we communicate and how do we keep everyone on the same page? Uh, you know, so there are a set of skills around teamwork that I think are a huge opportunity for people in our industry That's that I think ties maybe to some of the evolution of how things are getting done in today's environment versus how they may have been done uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So that that's inter interesting because going back to that SAM model, you've got set direction, align, and then motivate. So with this idea of alignment, um, made me think of that the teamwork aspect. 
what are some key ways to get, um, once we know the, the big picture and assuming we buy into it, what's, what are some of the key ways to get that alignment that you're looking for? Yeah, and that, that alignment is usually talking about resource allocation within our industry and, you know, alignment of the team, but also alignment of, you know, does everyone have what they need to be successful? So there are a couple of things there, which, you know, at, at the, the most basic part is just the aspect that I mentioned of, does everyone have what they need from a resources perspective? You know, is the right team out? Is, are the right people on the job? They have the right equipment and tools and resources. So, I mean, obviously that's a given and kind of a fundamental side of it. The, uh, the more soft skill side is, you know, are we creating ownership among the people? Are we leveraging the collective strengths of the team? And, you know, are we putting people in the right seats? Because everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. And how do we as leaders make sure that we have the right people on the bus, of course, in the Jim Collins version, but then also is everyone in the right seat on the bus that suits their personal capabilities and skill set? And, you know, getting that team then aligned around the goal, removing obstacles for them is a huge thing that we always also try to dial in on from an industry perspective is that. At the end of the day, construction is this series of obstacles. And to the extent that we can remove the obstacles and, and keep everyone focused on the goal, uh, we'll ultimately be successful. How do you manage the dynamic or the tension that ex- exists within construction companies when um, there's there's the big team, but then there's teams within the team? So my project team is building project X. Her project team is building project Y. And we have this pool of resources that we share, but it's limited. And I'd like the resources because I want to get my uh, project done on time and on budget. She wants the resources as well. There has to be some sharing, some teamwork across teams. How do you handle that kind of dynamic, that challenge in your business? Yeah, our organization is, is structured pretty much across the board in the way that you just described, which is, you know, and the way we look at it is team of teams, which, you know, they're books by that name and, sure. and plenty of resources to study. But that concept of team of teams is one that really identifies with us as an organization. We don't have uh, much hierarchy at all uh, or little to no hierarchy in this concept that everyone is there to get a job done. But you know, to your point, it creates chaos. And if you look at the models of team of teams versus traditional hierarchy, it looks like chaos. And it certainly can be chaotic in this concept of sharing and working together I think is where culture comes into play. So, you know, the op, the aspect of culture is how are we sharing? How are we working together to produce the, the greatest outcome? And, you know, we lean heavily on our team leaders because our organization is this network series of teams. The team leaders all have these great interpersonal relationships. And we spend a lot of time building trust and relationships among the team leaders, which then puts them in a position to then also understand the why behind what they're doing, the greater good. And, you know, that aspect of sharing versus protecting your own resources or territory starts to open up when you're in this position of a high degree of trust among the team leaders. They become very open to what's for the greater good of the the organization holistically versus my own team or my own silo. You know, I'm looking at the bigger picture because I understand the why behind what I'm doing. So that just takes those same concepts that you're deploying at a team level and trying to have that same philosophy and the same set of concepts that unites and makes all the teams work together across the the network and across the entire organization. Hey, this is Eric. Hope you're enjoying my conversation with Wes. Just a quick reminder, construction genius, effective, hands-on, practical, simple, no BS, leadership, strategy, Sales and Marketing Advice for Construction Companies. This is the one book you need if you are a leader in a construction company. You can go to Amazon and purchase yourself a copy. You can read all of the five-star reviews that we have there, and it will transform the way that you lead. Please buy this copy for you and everyone in your construction company who's in a leadership role because it will give them those simple, effective, straight-to-the-point, no BS strategies to help them improve their leadership help them improve their selling, their marketing, and even their strategic thinking. So it's an all-in-one package, and it only costs 20 bucks on Amazon. Let's get back to the episode with Wes. 
How do you tie your incentive structure to that that um, perspective of team of teams? Because again, you know, some companies they bonus people based on how they produce, and so therefore they're incentivized to to access and hoard resources as much as possible, and it makes sense. How do, how do you handle that? We've got a a series of different ways we do it from an incentive perspective. Uh, at the the fundamental place, everyone in our organization participates in our short-term incentive comp program, our typical bonus program that, you know, of course, many companies in our industry have. And in our case, the way we structured it, that short-term incentive is basically broken down and it's, it's a structured incentive comp program that everyone knows exactly what they would end up getting provided that we meet goals. And so we actually publish. And so if I start at maybe the highest level, we publish company results on a monthly basis to the entire organization those results tie to the annual goals. And so those are expressed as a percentage of goal. And we publish that in an open book manner along the way. So people know how the organization's doing. And one third of their incentive compensation comes from the organizational performance. And then as we've developed different businesses and market sectors, and you know we have infrastructure teams, we have building construction teams, we have different offices. So, as we started to develop teams, we started to look at team performance and have a third of the incentive comp come and be derived directly from your own team. The last third is individual. Every I mentioned this a minute ago that everyone in our organization has personal improvement goals. Those goals are, are set in conjunction with a supervisor slash mentor in the organization early on. Those goals are generally highly personal in terms of what are you working on and what are you developing as an individual. Um, one of those goals is usually a stretch goal, but that last third becomes a component of how are you developing as an individual. And for any of the program to activate, the piece I, I didn't mention is that there are certain hurdles and thresholds that we have to meet for the program to ultimately turn on and activate, which then protects the, the organization with this thought process that we need to continue to grow and reinvest. And, you know, the company is a high growth business. And so for us to grow and, and reinvest, there has to be some threshold of base profitability that the organization needs to reach, you know, before we start filling up that incentive comp bucket. And so that, so that none of that incentive um, program kicks in unless those minimums are reached. Is that, is that, am I hearing that right? Right. There well, has two different thresholds, but yes, at, at the basic level, that's the, the concept is that we've got to, you know, the organizational bucket fills up first before it starts spilling over into the incentive comp bucket. Excellent. I like that. So a third is a comp- the company you're incentivized based on company performance. A third is your team's performance. And I'm assuming the team is clearly defined so people understand what team they're on um, within the mm-hmm. team. And then a third is your individual performance. Correct. Very good. And there are opportunities to do better and multipliers. And, you know, there's a couple of, of nuances to that, like the stretch goal that I mentioned. Yes. You know, many times we'll define a stretch goal uh, ordinarily and it, or an example of that it, relative to individual performances. Do you identify or bring forward an improvement to what we do? Because we are a continuous improvement organization. Do you bring forward an improvement which anyone in our organization could do at any level? You point to something that others around you could then use. So you're you're creating some improvement or helping to move forward some strategic initiative that impacts the broader organization and creates opportunities for others to learn and grow. That's the type of thing that we would see as a stretch goal for an individual. And they, they get recognized and get the additional credit associated with doing something that is bigger than yourself is basically the concept. Yep, that's excellent. Um, it's a tale as old as time. You take a highly technically skilled and successful project manager who loves building projects and does it very well, and then you promote them into a more senior role where instead of building projects, they now have to lead a team of people who are building projects. What is the biggest struggle that you've seen in your experience for people making that shift from being a project manager to a project executive or senior leader? It's a tough one. And, um, you know, very few do it 
make that transition and leap without some set of challenges. And, you know, I honestly believe it's, it's hard to say that there's some one size fit, fits all uh, in terms of what the primary challenge is, because the obvious that everyone is aware of is, you know, you're moving from being self-managed and managing projects to now managing people instead of jobs. And so the intricacies of what it takes to show up as a leader and manage an entire team around you is a completely different skill set than what it is to be highly successful as a project manager, as you've already stated. And we always find that it's extremely individualized and, you know, by in, in our organization with those personal, very personalized development plans and, and opportunities and goals for personal improvement, we are usually trying to dial into strengths and weaknesses of individuals and knowing the skill set from other instances and or what has produced success in our culture in terms of the, the set of attributes and core competencies that makes up a good project executive, as an example. So for that project manager, and usually across the board, everyone that we've encountered, it just depends on the individual, you know, yeah. and you're dealing with people. So there's no one size fits all. Everyone has a different set of challenges of what the biggest impediment is for them to make the leap. And, in, and certainly uh, in some instances, you know, as much as you try to continue to move people up in their careers, in certain instances, people are much more successful and happier just managing projects because there are a lot of headaches that come from managing people instead of projects. And so, you know, we also encourage that in our organization that, you know, don't feel like you have to move up just for the sake of moving up. I mean, if, if you're fulfilled, there's nothing wrong with being the best project manager and taking on more challenging jobs and bigger jobs and different types of jobs. And, you know, we encourage everyone to continue to grow as individuals and there are opportunities to do that without moving up per se and, and starting to manage a big team of people. That's that leap is not for everyone and, and one that we try to pretty thoroughly vet out. Uh, before we go there. So um, having said all that, and I, I appreciate what you're saying there, Wes, that you know each person is different. Um, when you make that promotion, what are the key things that you're thinking about in the first 30, 60, 90 days that you want to really dial in with that newly promoted leader? That one is very tough and, you know, again, hard to, uh, to generalize, but those promoted leaders, I, I think, it's that same set that we find, as I, I mentioned, the, the core attributes of we, we try to keep things generally dialed in and pretty succinct. And those core attributes that I started out with around that SAM model and how they're showing up leading a team versus the skills that they learned and succeeded with at a high level managing projects. And those team attributes are generally the things or the, the how we show up to manage a team is generally where we would pull from to say, OK, this is the opportunity for you as an individual to show up differently for your team. And in that transition, we've got a uh, pretty active with the mentoring structure I'm, I've talked about already. Yes. We're very actively working with those individuals on a consistent basis and especially through that type of transition. I think it just becomes about having the right coach and mentor that works with them. And we've got a large group, and I don't know that I've mentioned that before. We've got a large group in our organization that are in new positions because as we continue to grow, we love to promote from within. We've got a big percentage of our organization that are doing things they've never done before. Mm -hmm. And the way that we handle that in our organization is generally through that very highly individualized career plans, opportunities for improvement, and then coaching and mentoring. So we've got a large number of people in our organization that work with external executive coaching. Mm -hmm. We've got internal mentors that they meet with. And so, you know, I know your question earlier was, how do we find time to do all this stuff? But, um, you know, we just have to make it a priority. And, uh, and supporting people through that transition is... Um, has, is a big part of that. Okay. So a couple of questions on that. Um, the first one is about the mentoring and this may be, that's just maybe me, but some, sometimes what people bring up is I'm having a struggle motivating my senior folks to mentor others because there's a fear that I'm mentoring my replacement. What do you have to say to that? I, um, I think that's a cultural thing. Mm. Um, you know, and it's another shift in, 
probably the industry. I can certainly understand where you're coming from with that statement from an industry perspective, but you know, answering it from our perspective as an organization, one of the key factors of leaders being successful in our organization are being humble. And that Patrick Lencioni, humble, hungry, smart model is another thing that we talk about a lot in our organization, which is from Patrick Lencioni's ideal team player yep. book, which I love, by the way, for anyone in the construction industry to grab that because the parable in the, the story in the book is told through the lens of the construction industry. So it's a really neat one for our industry, but regardless, that those individuals do really well in our organization. So if someone is coming at it from a, a level of humility that our leaders generally do well uh, and succeed with, what we find is that their goal is ultimately to develop people that are better than yeah. them. And so I, I think some of that comes from a place of humility and recognizing that we don't know it all and we're the organization and the greater good is going to be better off if I can develop people to be better than me. And, you know, that idea of individuals succeeding and moving up and maybe one day taking your place is actually seen as a win and is celebrated within a culture when, um, when it's handled correctly. And I'm assuming then that you can align that idea of celebration when someone takes your place with the fact that, Hey, listen, we're growing and we have other opportunities so we're always looking for the right person in the right position as the company continues to expand. That's exactly right. The, the individuals who are excelling understand and know that they better train their replacement if they want to move yeah. up. So there's that opportunity as well of the organization starts at, you know, I guess perceived, although we look at our organization as, as a, a kind of upside down organizational chart if we if we were to have one although um, you know we've never published an organizational chart it's just another side note but the the organizational chart means that you know we've got to develop people at all levels and that upside down concept is that you know the the core of the business are the people that are actually doing the work and you know we've got to develop each layer of the organization and if I want to move up myself, I have to develop people around me who are going to do what I used to do. So the opportunity for a promotion is generally because you've already trained your replacement. Okay. You said you've never published an org chart. Tell me why. <laughs> we, um, because we, we also have a philosophy. I mentioned this before. We don't use uh, traditional job titles. So you won't find on an email signature, uh, a business card or within our organization, a lot of talk about job titles and who's in what position. Now, externally, for the sake of a proposal, right. let's say, you have to give them something, you know. So, for the sake of a project proposal, people certainly use the titles of superintendent and project manager. And, you know, in a competitive process, you certainly have to be able to delineate who's who from a client perspective. Sure. So, those are the instances where we would have more of a project based structure that obviously is necessary to create some clarity within an RFP, but internally we've never published an organizational chart for the reason that well, it ties to start off with one of our core values is called sweep floors, right. which is this concept that no one's above any task and we all do whatever it takes to get the job yep. done. So it's this humble attention to detail and, you know, we're all constantly striving for excellence and we're going to work together and that no one's above any task. And so from that core value, that corresponded to, we don't really care what your title is because we're all here to ultimately achieve an outcome and we all have a role to play in that collective outcome. So that translated initially to job titles and then to this resistance of um, pushing against some industry norms of, again, traditional hierarchy. And we're not going to publish and portray ourselves as an organization with traditional hierarchy, because that's just not how we operate. Yep. We're a team of teams. And, you know, if you try to chart out a team of teams and if you look at the team of teams charts that are out there, I mean, it's a mess, you know, it's this network spider web, yep. it, you know, it's, um, it, it doesn't create a lot of clarity. And so, you know, we've generally just stayed away from publishing org charts and, you know, I guess I've been, it, it's been a little bit of a challenge for myself from a, um, 
a leadership perspective because certainly I've been challenged along the way that, you know, certain individuals feel like, well, you can do that when you're smaller, but when you get to this size, you're going to have to publish an org chart to create clarity. And so we've just continued to resist that. And today at about 250 million in revenue, we still haven't done it. That's great. I think an important point here, Wes, is that, um, your business can be whatever you want it to be. That's one of the privileges and responsibilities we have as business owners is that we, our businesses are a reflection of us and the culture that we create is because of who we are. And therefore, if you understand yourself, like you seem, seem to, then you're able to intentionally put that into practice as you're building your business. And you don't have to be like somebody else. Earlier, you, you talked about the, the mentor roles, and then you also talked about bringing in external executive coaching. Um, some companies, they, they don't like doing that because of alignment issues, um, you know, um, not wanting to invest in, in bringing in outsiders who may bring perspectives that, that they don't want to hear. How do you go about picking your executive coaches or any outside resources that you haven't developed yourself? We develop those relationships, the people that are engaged specifically in the external coaching. Uh, you know, we haven't gotten to the point as an organization where, you know, we, lo we love things being in-house. So I'll start by yeah. saying that, that, you know, we, we try to do as much in-house as possible and have less consulting. But, you know, for our organization, we haven't gotten to the point for that to be a, a full-time role. And so we do have a great, uh, actually two different partners that, we're aligned with. And I think, you know, the key there is just putting in the time, developing the relationships that actually started with coaching just a few people. Yep. And so we have one particular uh, relationship that coach is currently coaching about 35 people in our organization. And so it's one individual that meets with 35 different people on a regular yep. basis. And so that's a, I mean, this, particular individual is in our office a couple of days a week. So, you know, call it a, a part-time in-house resource yep. is almost how we handle it. Um, and that started five years ago by working with and mentoring a few members of the executive team. Yep. So there, you know, that, that individual was able to gain this deep understanding of who we are as an organization and get aligned before. So along the way, each year we've added a few more people. And so, I think it's almost in the way that I would describe it because I would share some and, and some of the reservations of of the external perspective, maybe changing or altering the cult, the culture. And in this case, we know we're aligned and, you know, it's a process that we actually stay up to date with um, and and stay pretty close to as well. And we've got a trusted resource in that capacity. You mentioned that, you you know, you you prefer internal resources to external resources. And I, I totally understand that. What would be one or two advantages of external resources that you're you're thinking, I always want to be able to tap into that particular aspect of having an external resource? Well, I think the, the danger of being all internal is that you kind of only know what you know. And, you know, for that team and, you know, each new member of the team certainly brings new perspectives and new opinions, but, you know, that team kind of knows what it knows. And so that's where I've seen us really enjoy and leverage the external consulting realm uh, for a variety of different services is just to bring new ideas, new perspectives, and new expertise. We're currently doing that with our executive team is working with a consultant who's a national expert on leadership development, actually on this topic. And the goal of that is to create better alignment among the executive yeah. team. And so you know, even the executive team is investing in that same thought process that we look for our people to grow as leaders. We all have to grow as well. And so we actually have someone who's an external resource that I know that's not something that we would be able to facilitate or do on our own. And it's a, I think that's a, a great example or an opportunity to leverage someone externally to help create that alignment uh, among the executive team and help us chart the next chapter. And part of this engagement is create alignment and then map, help us map out what the next five years look like on our leadership development journey. So we're in the midst of that. That's tremendous. Tremendous. Um, so tell us a little bit more about your business, Wes. We started out uh, just over 10 years ago, actually. So we, we started in April of 2013. 
as a very, I guess what I'd call, you know, somewhat typical commercial construction startup. So I started, I was the founder of the business and I was very lucky to bring in a great core team out of the gate. And we hit the ground running and had a period of rapid growth for the first few years. And over the first three years had tremendous success. I mean, we're in a fairly small market down in New Orleans, Louisiana. We're not in a a giant city, but had tremendous success with a great team, some really good relationships in the market. And we went zero to 100 million in revenue in the first 36 months. Uh, So very aggressive growth out of the gate. And then we always had this vision to be a true builder. And so we started to expand service offerings and got into heavy civil was the next thing that we jumped into. And so in terms of market sector today, we are doing building, we're doing heavy civil construction, which has been a high growth area of the business over the last few years. Then we've also added a number of self-performed capabilities over that same time period. And this theory of being a true builder And then philosophically, we've always seen an opportunity for the industry more broadly to improve. Uh, So, you know, fundamentals and and the kind of principles that the business is built on is a great culture, developing leaders, having an impact in everything we do. And then the idea of innovation and that the industry has a lot of space and opportunity to improve uh, how we do things. So we're constantly pushing the envelope, challenging the status quo as an organization. And then, you know, even though it's kind of a a little bit of an anomaly because, you know, of course the construction industry used to do things in more of a self-perform model where, you know, what I would call a true builder, that was somewhat of the older model. Most GCs kind of gravitated away from that over time. We always saw that as an opportunity to differentiate as well. And you know, see tremendous value in the in the ability to do some of the work yourself as a as a GC and that self perform capability and being a true builder as being one of the differentiators and and in a way I've always viewed that as to some extent even though it's kind of an older way of doing things in today's day and age it's it's I think an opportunity for innovation because developing and and retaining a workforce of talented individuals we believe will ultimately allow us to gravitate into places of prefabrication, new ways of doing things. And, you know, being able to do something in a factory environment means that you have to have the skilled labor to do so. And so that's where I think the opportunity comes in to start to leverage some of that idea of being a builder in the space of innovation. And so we're already started down that road as well uh, with an innovation lab and a fabrication facility and uh, a few other things. So we've come a long way over the course of of 10 years, you know, as I mentioned a minute ago today, we're at about 250 million in revenue. We're continuing to grow. We have opened an office in Nashville. So we're working regionally uh, around the Nashville market, as well as regionally around New Orleans and the state of Louisiana and a little bit into the Gulf Coast uh, in terms of geographic region. We're in multiple different market sectors. Uh, The team is 230 or so people today. And aggressively growing on all fronts in a in a very broad way across all the different segments of the bi- business that I just mentioned are all are all currently growing. And your website is buildimpetus.com? Buildimpetus.com is the primary construction yep. company. There's another website, thinkrngd.com, which you'll the links are all, all embedded within the website yep. as well. Uh, that's that's our innovation lab and prefab uh, business. And then we also have our Palmasano Foundation. So we run a 501c3 that's pretty embedded in the the communities where we do business. Uh, You know, I mentioned the the academy, which we call Renegade Academy. Uh, So, you know, those things are are, you can get to or or find on that buildimpetus.com. Excellent. I got two more questions for you. One is um, how do you maintain your sanity in the midst of a growing company like this? What do you do, like specifically practices or something that you do every day, every week that helps you to maintain your sanity? Uh, Routine is the main thing uh, that I find as an individual that um, that has really set me free. And so that from that routine perspective, I try to eliminate as many decisions as possible from the day 
and go through my days in a very similar manner. You know, if the routine of waking up at the same time. Uh, I'm a big believer in exercise and, you know, the benefits of exercise and keeping your body at the best version of yourself possible things as, as much as I generally would wear every day. So I got a, a uniform, um, you know, I kind of eat the same things most days, you know, so those are the things that for me, I would say are routine oriented. I try to have a pretty structured day. I'm highly scheduled. Uh, I've got a pretty specific organizational system that works really well for me. And so, yeah, I mean, the, the pressures of continuing to grow, juggling a lot, I've almost doubled down over time and gotten more regimented about my routine and sticking to what works for me. And that's something that I just find kind of sets me free to, to do my best work and, and be real dialed in and focused over, um, over the day. That's excellent. And then last question I've got to ask. I'm in New Orleans. I'm visiting. What's the one restaurant I need to hit? Oh, there's I know, so but let's say I'm going That's out of my routine. You know what I'm saying? For like, it's it's my cheat day. I'm cheat day in New Orleans. Where am I going? <laughs> there are so many good ones. What kind of food I'm, do you I'm, like? I'm agnostic. I'll eat anything. All right. One of my favorites is not far from the office here. And it's it actually, there, there are a lot of older restaurants in New Orleans, I'll, I'll add to this, that have been around for a long time that are great to visit. And so I'll give a, a little bit of a, a nod and plug certainly to some of those institutions, but there's a newer restaurant that I love just because I generally, you know, even if it's a, a cheat day, I like to keep things uh, generally pretty clean and healthy. And so there's a place called Pesh, which is a, they do a great job of kind of a modern take on New Orleans seafood. And, you know, it's not the heavy fried stuff. It's generally uh, a little bit of a, I guess you could say like a Mediterranean diet type approach, but it's fresh New Orleans local seafood. Uh, How do you spell place. that? Pesh, P-E-C-H-E. Yeah, just like the fish in French, eh? That's it. That's right on. It. Wes, you've been uh, tremendously helpful here. I, I really appreciate your insights. And um, thank you for joining us today on Construction Genius. Thank you thank for you. having me. Thank you for listening to my episode today with Wes. It was a great conversation. I hope you found it useful. Um, make sure you check out that one book by Lencioni about the team player. That's a good one. Lencioni is really good, Patrick Lencioni. And so you want to check out that book as well. And, uh, you know, feel free to connect with Wes on LinkedIn. Um, he's doing some great work with his construction company. And um, I think you'll find it useful getting to know him. And so thank you for listening to Construction Genius here today.